Welcome to Kingdom Connection with Pastor Jensen Franklin. I have a question for you. When life becomes challenging, when your hopes are shattered, when your faith is tested, what is your first response? I would love to tell you that my immediate impulse is to thank God and praise Him. But to be honest, more often than not, I complain like a four-year-old. Eventually, I'll come around to the realization that God is still good and that He's ultimately in control, and I will praise Him for that. But hopefully, as we mature, praise and worship won't just be a response. They'll become who we are. I long to be in a place where worship is a lifestyle, not just an activity. I'm reading today from Psalms 118. I'll begin reading with verse 24. Would you read it with me at all the campuses if you can? This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Keep going. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Come on, keep going. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with the cords to the horns of the altar. Keep going, everybody. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. You read that like a bunch of spirit-filled, Bible-believing blood-washed, Holy Ghost-filled, bunch of crazy Christians. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you today, and the message that I'm preaching comes in the form of a question. Are you still in love with praise? I want you to understand that there's a difference between worshiping and being a worshiper. One is a lifestyle. The other is moments of euphoria. John McCain, the deceased senator from Arizona, was captured during the Vietnam War, and he served seven years in imprisonment of the Vietnamese army. 30 to 40, he tells in a book that he wrote that 30 to 40 of them were placed in each cell, many of our soldiers there for many years. And he said in what they call the, um, the Hanoi Hilton, uh, there they were incarcerated. And there was a man that he served time with in that prison camp by the name of Mike Christian. And Mike Christian did something soon after he was captured. He took different colors of threads from different clothing, and he got a bamboo needle And he sewed an American, tiny American flag into the garment that he was given that he had to wear the prison clothes. And every day when he would hang the shirt up on a nail in his prison cell with the other 30 or 40 men, they said that he would put his hand on his heart and the others would join him. And they would say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And of course, the Vietnamese uh, prison guards couldn't understand why every night they turned toward the garments that were hanging on nails. only, Only the prisoners knew there was a tiny red, white, and blue flag that had been sewn in under what the eye could see. And one day there was one of the guards who examined the clothes and found that tiny American red, white, and blue flag. And when they found it, the first thing they did is they came in and they ripped it to pieces, ripped the shirt to pieces and caught it on fire and burned it up. And then they took Mike Christian and they beat him for hours and hours and hours until he was literally at the point of death, according to John McCain. And they brought him back around 11 p.m. at night and threw him, he was stripped naked with no clothing, threw him into that room. They said that one side of his face was beaten so severely that he was purple 
almost on the whole, or blue on the whole side because his eye was bruised. His face was so bruised that it was blue and he had blood all over his, every, all kinds of injuries and blood just all over his body. And they gave him a white uniform to put on. So I want you to see the picture. All of a sudden, all of those soldiers, as he's laying there in the, in the red of his own blood and the blue of his own bruise and the white of the cheap prison garment that he had put on, one of the soldiers noticed he's not wearing the colors. He is the colors. So they put their hand on their heart and they said, we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and went through the whole pledge of allegiance because he wasn't wearing the colors. He, he had become the colors. You see, there's a lot of people who come to church to worship, but I want to tell you that you don't just need to wear worship. You need to be worshiped. It's not just something that I am to do. It's what I am supposed to be. It's not what I come on Sunday and do. It's what I am. I've got to do more than wear it. I've got to be it. I've got to really love him. I've got to be in love with praise and worship and honoring and glorifying Jesus. David was, if more than anybody in the scripture, God's song and dance man. He was the man who wrote the Psalms that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. He and Moses were songwriters and musicians, and they wrote the book of Psalms. And the Bible said that when David went down to the battlefield one day to take some cheese and bread to his brothers, that he noticed the army of Israel in the trenches and he heard the giant. And something in him began to get annoyed that the people of God were better at digging foxholes than fighting. And he knew they had lost their praise, but he had been out in the mountains praising and worshiping God, singing. You know, David took praise breaks. That whole phrase really is David's. The Bible said, he said, seven times a day, I will praise the Lord. That's a Bible verse. We take tea breaks and coffee breaks. He took seven praise breaks a day and he'd go along and every few hours he'd stop everything and dance and praise the Lord and sing a song or turn on, put on his garment of praise and worship the Lord. And here he is. And the Bible said that somebody came up to him and they said, Hey, you know, if you go fight that giant, the King said, do you get three things? Number one, you get a free house with no taxes. Number two, you get a part of the king's wealth. And number three, you get to marry his daughter. And David looked at the giant and said, he's ugly and looked at his daughter and said, she's pretty. And he said, you're going to die today. One of us are going to leave this field. And he went out there and he got to thinking about no taxes. And he said, hallelujah, this is worth fighting for. And he went out there and he said, you know, getting the wealth and being in the palace. I, I'm, I'm, he was, a, he was country before country was cool. There was nothing about, he was a country boy. He, he was, he was more country than cornbread. He, he, this boy had never been to anywhere near a palace. And he thought if I'm going to get to do it. And the Bible said, after he slew Goliath, that Saul called him to the palace. He said, I want to introduce you to my oldest daughter. Here she is. Her name was Mirab, Mirab. And the Bible said that when he introduced her and I could almost see him in my mind, he probably had on Wrangler jeans and cowboy boots and a tractor hat. What do you call it? John Deere hat and all of that. And and, 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 and he's looking at this beautiful, stunning girl and he says, how you doing? And she takes one look at him. This is in your Bible. Now I'm paraphrasing the John Deere part in, in there, but I'm, but you know what I'm saying. And, and most people read right over this and forget this. The Bible said that Mirab looked at him and she called her dad and said in so many words, dad, I've got a problem. I don't want to marry this thing. Why did you bring, look at him. He wants to look at him. He, he look at him. And, and the scripture said that she told her father, I am in love 
with a drill that some guy named a drill. I'm in love with a drill. A drill. I don't want this country boy. And and all of a sudden, the Bible said that there was a crisis. But then it says in First Samuel 18 and verse uh, 20 that there was another girl named Michal, and she spoke up. And the Bible said she loved David. And the Bible said in verse 28 again, she loved David. Now, David could be a type of praise. And in other words, she was the king's daughter and she loved praise. But there was another king's daughter in the house that didn't love praise. And I wrote this question many years ago, and I want to ask it to every one of you listening to me at all of our campuses today. How can you be a king's kid and not be attracted to praise? How can you have royal blood in your veins and not be attracted to praise? I don't understand how born again people can get saved and never ever have a desire to praise the Lord. What water is to a fish, what air is to a bird, what what air is to a human, praise is to a Christian. And just like a fish won't make it long without water, and a bird won't ever be much and go high without air, and a human won't live long without oxygen, a Christian will not make it long without... And worship. And if you're not used to it, it's not a Baptist thing. It's not a Presbyterian thing. Praise is not a Pentecostal thing. It is a Bible thing. And you are commanded, if you have breath, praise the Lord. Don't care how cool and smooth you are. Praise the Lord. If you're a king's kid, praise the Lord. Any king's kids listening to me, I give you this chance. Praise the Lord. There was a day when Michal loved David. The Bible said her father, Saul, despised David. Saul is a type of the devil, and the devil despises praise because he used to be heaven's praise leader. And when you praise God, you take his place. And the Bible said in 1 Samuel chapter 19 that Saul hated David so much 
that in Psalm in, in Sam, first Samuel 19, he sent assassins to his house to kill him while he was sleeping. And Michal woke up. And something in her intuition said something's not right. And she heard the assassins knocking on the door and she ran and opened the window and woke praise up and said, you got to go out this window and escape lest you die. You know what she was doing? She was, she said, you got to learn how when you get in dark times and when troubles at the door, you got to learn how to open the window and let praise out. You got to let praise live to see another day. That's what you do when it's dark. That's what you do when real trouble comes to your life. You don't just sit there and let your praise die, but you open up the window and let praise out and know that this is weeping may endure for the night, but praise is going to see another day. And I'm going to, I'm going to say, send this praise on out in this dark hour. Now, I want you to understand it was Mikhail who enjoyed and encouraged in the darkest time of their life, this man to praise the Lord. But if you fast forward 20 and a half years later, the Bible said that a lot of things had changed. David was now king of Israel. He was coming back to Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant. He had singers and musicians and every six paces, they would stop and he would offer sacrifices. And the Bible said he would dance before the Lord with all of his might and strength, all of his might, all of his strength. This man was a warrior and a killer, but this big old man would begin to praise God and dance so wildly that he did it. One translation said, with every fiber and muscle in his body moving, praising, dancing, shouting, jumping, leaping. And his wife now, 20 and a half years later, looked out the window, the same window she had opened, maybe, and let him escape and kept praise alive. Now life has done something to her. Problems have done something to her. A lot can happen in 20 and a half years. You can start out on fire. You can start out in love with praise and church and God and the Bible and what the Lord means to you. But a lot of trials can come in 7,478 days. A lot of setbacks, a lot of deaths, a lot of divorces, a lot of illnesses. And there came a day as he was bringing it back that the Bible said she looked out her window and she despised him for praising the Lord. Maybe she said to herself, I don't need to be in love with praise like I used to be. I don't need to thank God like I used to be when I first fell in love with him. Something happened to her, but I've got a word for you today. If he is the same yesterday and if he is the same tomorrow, he is the same today.
Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And David, when she said, you embarrass me, you, you're acting crazy, you shouldn't be doing this, he looked up at her and he said, I want you to understand something. Before your daddy ever put me in the palace, before your daddy knew who I was, God knew who I was. Before the army of Israel ever knew who I was, God knew who I was. Before Samuel the prophet ever poured oil on me and before my own father knew who I was, he didn't even ask me to stand in the line because he didn't think I was kingly material. And he said, bring all the sons of Jesse, but he didn't call for David because he knew that boy's a loser. But he said, what my my daddy, earthly daddy, didn't know. My heavenly father knew. And he said, if you think I'm not going to praise him now. See, David, 20 and a half years later, was still a praiser. I don't know about you. Some of you have been praising the Lord a while. But if you don't have as much as you had when you started, it's time to go back and get it and begin to praise the Lord again. We can't go out with a whimper. We got to go up with a shout. Don't let years of life divorce you from what you once loved. The Bible said that when she cursed him for praising, she became barren and never produced children again. You want to become barren? You want to stop seeing the fruitfulness of God? Then you stop worshiping. You stop praising. There's something about praise that is so powerful when we understand it and we fall in love with it. It just takes one generation, one generation to lose praise in a church. That's why I defend it. That's why I constantly rehash and come back with messages on praise. Because the Bible said that we are in Psalms 145 in verse four, one generation shall praise him to another and they shall declare his mighty works. One generation is supposed to praise, and when one generation is kind of fading out, they're supposed to praise God so much that it's passed on to the next and passed on. It's not supposed to be diminished. It's not supposed to get quieter. It's not supposed to get more distant and distant and distant from God. And if we don't watch it and if we're not intentional about our praise... We'll lose a whole generation and all it takes is one generation to drop the baton. May we never say we don't need that anymore in the church. As long as I'm pastor and I will be here a long time. And as long as I'm pastor, this is going to be a praise in church. And it's going to be that way at all our campuses. And if you're not comfortable with it, get comfortable with it. Because we're going to, you know, there's only 30 minutes of silence in heaven. God's going to say, all right, cut it out. Shh. And all of heaven will go quiet. And so start the clock, angel. This is for all those little quiet, mousy Christians. And he's going to give you 30 minutes out of all eternity. And the, this is in your Bible. And at the end of 30 minutes, he's going to hit it. And he's going to say, all right, let it rip. And we're going to go back to praising God throughout all eternity. I close with this, but in 1 Samuel chapter 22, there's an amazing story. The Bible said that there was an uprising and Saul was trying to kill David. And there were 86 priests that assisted David that were slaughtered and only one of them, there were 86 and 85 of them were slaughtered and only one of them escaped. And when he escaped, he came to David and the Bible said he had his ephod or his praise garment in his hand. There's something wrong with that statement because worship and an ephod was not, it's not how you wear it in your hand. It's supposed to be on you. And the Bible said that he took the tunic in his hand. He carried it in his hand, but because there's a difference between worshiping and being a worshiper. 
Sooner or later, you're going to find out through the trials of life. Do you have this thing called faith and praise in your hand or in your heart? Because when trouble comes, when problems come, when crisis come, it's not enough to, I praise in church. It's like a robe in my hand. It's something that I have to be. I have to be a worshiper. I have to be a person of worship. Do you worship or are you a worshiper? Kingdom Connection is a soul-winning ministry that is reaching the world through broadcasting, expanding into new church campuses, and global acts of compassion. By using the technology of today to fulfill the Great Commission, we are able to connect with countless people and reach hundreds of thousands of lives. Our broadcast connects with people like you all around the world with messages that speak to them. Our ministry exists to help build a connection for strengthening your faith and living out your God-given purpose. And our missions and relief work help connect you to desperate situations, showing the love of Christ through global acts of compassion. We feel the time is right and God is leading us to grow, and that only happens when you partner with us through Connection Partnership. With as little as a dollar a day, you'll be helping us reach further than we've ever been before. To become a part of this ministry and enjoy exclusive partner benefits, visit us online at jensenfranklin.org. Hope starts with you. Together, we can do something incredible for the kingdom of God. Your support helps us preach the gospel to over 200 nations around the globe, produce inspirational resources, and continue support for outreach projects. All donations received through a campaign are subject to redirection at the discretion of the organization.